Hello. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Appreciate it. Uh, before we get started, I want to say uh, one thing that I do not believe in race to be an absolute truth. I speak of it as a historical and social reality. So don't accuse me of being a critical race theorist or anything like that. So. <laughs> But uh, I grew up here in Central Florida. I grew up in Seminole County. And when I was in school, I actually hated history. Oh, same with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and he's my student. <laughs> no, but I, I hated history class. I remember I, I even had, I had an F in history in eighth grade. Yes, I know yeah, my students don't. There's a chance I might get that too. <laughs> and I remember when like one of the reasons why I hated it was because I never could really see myself in the story of the heroes, right? Let me give you an example. When you see this image, what do you guys think of? Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln freeing the slaves. Lincoln freeing the slaves, right? The white man. Oh, that's what it is. That's now, what, what, what I also see is I see a, a black man on his knees, look like, looks like he's begging, right? And you see a, a white man standing strong and tall. This is emblematic of the kind of history that I felt like I was always getting in school growing up, right? And then we would also learn about like, you know, George Washington, the, the father of our country, learn about Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, All Men Are Created Equal. James Madison, the author of the Bill of Rights, and all these great documents. But then you do further research into these documents. I remember like when I was in fourth grade, I did a, a, a paper on Thomas Jefferson. I came to find out, that, yeah, he said all men are created equal, but he was a slave owner. So I'm like, I don't know, it, kind of, it, it became a little discouraging for me. I could never really see myself in the narrative that was being told. And then we had this thing called Black History Month. Forget about it. I was like one of the few black kids in my classes growing up in school. And every time Black History Month would come around, all the kids would stare at me. Anybody ever experienced that? And then we learned about Every time we would learn about people, this is not to discredit the civil rights movement or anything, but we always learned about black people begging to be accepted by white people who hated them so much. It would be like little black kids trying to get into a school where white people are standing guard at the front doors, like spitting at them, calling them names and all this stuff. But in spite of all that, these, these black people still wanted to be accepted by them. He's even had like Jerry Jones in the background. I don't know if you guys have seen that recently, but it's, it was demeaning to me. So as I got older, I was like, I want to know the other side of the story. I ended up eventually barely passing high school, like a 2.2 GPA or something like that. Went to Seminole Community College. I took trying to make those classes. I took the Dr. Wright, Dr. Stephen Wright, his English class. First time I ever had black professors in academia. And they exposed me to another type of history that I never really was exposed to before. And in this history, Dr. Wright, he gave me a Malcolm X tape one day. And I listened to this Malcolm X tape, and I was so moved by everything Malcolm X was saying. He was talking about standing on your own two feet. He was talking about self-sufficiency. He was talking about taking pride in yourself, who you are, where you come from. It was not this, this kind of history that you see here. So that made me more curious. As a matter of fact, I started to, to do a lot better in school. Started making better grades. Decided to go to graduate school. And decided to major in history the subject that I hated so much, and eventually started to research African resistance to enslavement. Because I knew it couldn't just be 
Black people as passive pawns accepting their plight for 400 years, like Kanye West was alluding to. They had to fight back. So I learned about this thing called a maroon community. Has anybody ever heard the term maroon? Yes. All right. Anybody want to? Uh, Dylan, what is a maroon? Um, it's basically just a community of black people who pretended to be slaves, but they were like the insurgents, and they just kept like, tabs and everything and freed the slaves. Okay, sometimes they did, they, at times they did pretend to be slaves, all right? The word maroon actually comes from the Spanish term cimarron. All right, the word cimarron was originally used to describe runaway cattle in Latin America that used to escape up into the mountains when the Spanish first colonized South America and Central America. Cimarron was then adopted by the French when the French started to bring slaves. They called it mahon, M-A-R-R-O-N. Then the British, they called it maroon. Right? And through time, wherever you had enslaved people being brought into the Americas, you also had people who would run away from slavery. But a maroon, in essence, was a group of people who said, I don't care what your law is. I don't care what your white man's law is. I'm going to flee the plantation on my own volition. I'm going to go up into the mountains. I'm going to hide in the swamps. I'm going to go into the forest. I'm going to go into the most remote parts of this society, and I'm going to draw a line in the sand, and I'm going to say, if you pass this line, you're going to get that work. And that's what a maroon was. They were fighters, and they created independent nations within nations. And a lot of times, we don't even validate these things in history. They brush it off, oh yeah, these, they call them fugitive slaves or runaways. Or they use legal terms to make it seem like they're doing something illegal. Well, in the eyes of the law, it's illegal. In the eyes of the laws, it's not even validated. But as you can see here, this map represents the myriad of communities that existed all throughout the Americas prior to emancipation days. See, when you study history from a de jure perspective, like a legal perspective, you would think that the white man granted freedom to people in 1865 in the United States, 1834 in Britain, 1848 in France, but when you look at the reality, if you study history from a de facto perspective, in fact, you would find that communities were formed of free people of African descent all throughout the Americas. Jamaica had their Maroons. Virginia had their Maroons. Mexico had their Maroons. In Colombia, they call them Amenques. In Brazil, they call them Quilombos. But maroon communities existed all over. And one of the places that had a very significant and powerful maroon community was right here in Florida. And I never knew that when I grew up here. I didn't learn it until, I, I didn't really learn this, the extent of it until I left Florida. I was living in Washington, D.C., Howard University in graduate school. That's when I learned all the, the details of Florida history. So it became my mission once I got my degree. My, my dissertation specifically was on the Maroons of Dominica. But I was like, you know what? I need to learn more about Florida. That's where I'm from. I'm going to teach there. So I want to expose this information to the public. Florida's Maroons, they originate. A lot of them originally came from Carolina, South Carolina. Once Carolina was established as a colony by the British, way back in the 1600s, early 1700s, a lot of Africans, mostly from the Congo region, mostly from the Senegal region, started to escape down in Florida. Not only did they escape down in Florida, they escaped all throughout, wherever they could find refuge. But the Spanish occupied Florida. The Spanish and the British were at odds since forever. So once the Spanish realized that a lot of Africans were running away into Florida, they said, well, we can use these people in our fight against the British. So in November 7, 1693, there was an edict that was issued where the Spanish basically said, all runaway Africans that make it into Spanish Florida will be granted their freedom. 
if they serve in the military and convert to Catholicism? Well, many of the Africans were actually from the Congo, and the Congo had converted to Catholicism since 1491. So, I'm not, it's not to say that all Congolese people were Catholics, but they had a familiarity with the, with the religion. This went on for years. Slave revolts, the, the, um, the 1739 Stoner Rebellion was all about people trying to get down to Florida. Eventually, they established a city, a little community, I should say, called Fort Mose. 1738, 1739, Fort Mose was established. By 1763, you had about 3,000 black people living in Florida, many of whom were the descendants of the runaway slaves. 1763, after the Seven Years' War, Florida was taken from the Spanish, got to the British. This lasted for 20 years. Many of those blacks had to evacuate. They left to Cuba. Some of them stayed. By 1783, it's retroceded to the Spanish at the American Revolutionary War. Now, the United States is an independent country. Right? As a matter of fact, there's one thing I forgot to point out. The, uh, anybody know why the state of Georgia was created? Why the colony of Georgia was created? It was for debtors. It was for debtors, yes. And they said there's no slavery to, slavery to be permitted in Georgia. For one, because these poor debtors, once they got out of their debt, we didn't want them to have to compete with the very wealthy slave owners. But two, number two is because Georgia was to serve as a buffer state between Carolina and Florida, right? So you don't have to worry about all those Africans continuing to run away. So they said no slavery is to be permitted in Georgia. But that only lasted like 15 years. People with economic influence started to change policies and stuff like that. But now you have the independent United States. 1783, um, you got our founding fathers. Now they're trying to figure out, okay, we got this nuisance of, of a Florida just to the south of us. You know, the Spanish, they're still enticing runaway slaves. They're offering, they're offering refuge to all Africans that go down there. And we gotta find a way to put a stop to this. So these next few, as a matter of fact, the next few slides that I show, Actually, pretty much for the rest of this this uh, this speech, I'm basically going to show you guys that the primary sources as to what was going on in high places of government, the military officers, and stuff like that. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, the president and the Secretary of State, they start to communicate first about this issue about the uh, the runaway slaves. On March 10, 1791, uh, Thomas Jefferson writes to the governor of Florida, Quesada, Juan Quesada, as a consequence of the same principles of justice and friendship, we trust that your excellency will permit and aid the recovery of persons of the same description who have, herefore, taken refuge within your government. The bearer here of James Segrove, Esquire, is authorized to concur in such arrangements as you shall approve for the recovery of such fugitives. So even in the highest places of government, they are talking about recovering these fugitives. May 20th, 1791, Washington, George Washington writes to James Seagrove, who was actually the ambassador to the Creek Nation, and was also one of the people that was assigned to discuss um, these issues of runaway slaves in Florida. So your first care will be to arrest the farther reception of fugitive slaves. Your next to obtain restitution of those slaves who have fled to Florida and your last subject, which may demand the greatest address, will be to give a retrospective force to procure the governor's order for a general relinquishment of all fugitive slaves who are the property of citizens of the United States. So not only did they want uh, this zero guy to go get the slaves that are running away right now, but they wanted to retroactively get the ones who had been running away the years prior. But the Spanish, they were like, okay, we'll do that. 
But the Spanish were, were saying, if we're gonna actually try to assist you guys in returning runaway slaves, you guys need to bring some receipts, okay? Some mortgages, you know, some bill of sales, some deeds. You can't just expect us to start rounding up black people that are living in Florida and then give them to you guys. August 2nd, 1791, Seagrove writes to Governor Quesada of Florida that in order to prevent fugitive slaves from the United States taking shelter in Florida, His Excellency the Governor will be pleased to issue his proclamation, ordering all officers, civil and military, within this colony, but particular those on, this, on the River St. Mary's, to stop all fugitive slaves and without delay convey them to the Spanish posts on Amelia Island. And December 15, 1791, which coincidentally is the day the Bill of Rights was ratified, from Jefferson to the governor of Georgia and South Carolina, I have the honor to enclose you an authenticated copy of the articles agreed on between the governor of East Florida and Mr. Seagrove acting for the United States by order of the president on the subject of fugitive Negroes. They are thinking that the Spanish are going to comply initially. 1791, everything's cool, but the Spanish are still waiting for receipts. The Spanish never get those receipts. Three or four years later, by 1794, 1795, the Spanish, they write back to the United States. They're like, we're not complying with your orders because you're not complying with our orders. So the tension ensued between the United States and Spain. And so the Spain or the people in Spanish Florida just said, you know what? We're rescinding on that whole agreement that we had before because you guys are, aren't obviously complying with our demands. So from the late 1700s, it's business as usual. But what happens in, anybody know what important thing happened in 1793 that they say led to the expansion of slavery in the South? 1793. That did happen. Yes, that was going on as well. Yes. But something specific to the United States that really. The invention of the cotton gin. Yeah, you said you know, you say, the invention of the cotton gin. So 1793, you have the invention of the cotton gin. And people are thinking, no, oh, this is going to lessen the degree of slavery in practice. You aren't going to be trading slaves as much because you have a machine to do a lot of the work. They're wrong. Slavery expanded more than ever before. And it was expanding all throughout Georgia like never before. At the time, um, Alabama and Mississippi weren't states yet. Uh, Louisiana would eventually become a state by 1812. But in all of these years, even though they were states, there were territories, and they continued to expand into these areas. So slavery was growing in the South, right near the border of Florida. As slavery is growing in the South, right near the border of Florida, what else do you think is also growing? Runaway. It's runaway slaves. Maroonage. So it got to the point where now the United States is really starting to worry about this. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people in Georgia that are really getting annoyed by the fact that their slaves keep running away. And they keep blaming on the fact that you have this peninsula to the south of us that is just a haven for runaways. And the people down there just keep encouraging and tricking other people. This is the words they use. Tricking other slaves to run, into, to run down into Florida for liberation. Another thing that was going on in the early 1800s in the Napoleonic Wars, which left Spain a little bit occupied. So a lot of a lot of people were thinking in the United States, this is the time that we can go and take Florida from the Spanish. They had this thing called the Patriot War that no one ever talks about. It's also referred to as the Other War of 1812. Right? In this Other War of 1812, you had a lot of planters who were actually living in Florida, but had, they had their roots in Georgia. They were living right over the border and had plantations there. They conspired with Georgia planters, the Georgia governor, even the Secretary of State, James Monroe, even the President of the United States, James Madison. 
and conspired to take Florida from the Spanish, an illegal invasion of Florida. But they wanted to keep it secret. They planned this in 1810. And they said, we're not going to let anybody know about this until 1812, March of 1812. So as soon as they go in, they send like uh, some, some army uh, troops, they send some volunteers, they send some Georgia militia, a mixture of people, about 125 of them. And they go into Florida and they invade for the purpose of taking over St. Augustine and taking Florida from the Spanish. But boy, they did not expect the type of uh, force that was down there in Florida. See, just because the Spanish are weak due to fighting the Napoleonic Wars doesn't mean that everybody else is, right? You still have the Africans living down there, the black people of African descent, and you still have the Native Americans down there, and they're fighting. So after three year, or three months of fighting, or four months of fighting, Governor David Mitchell, governor of Georgia, writes to the governor of Florida, he writes, your certain knowledge of the peculiar situation of the southern section of the, of the Union in regard to that description of people, talking about black people, one might have supposed would have induced you to abstain from introducing them into the province or of organizing such as were already in it. What is he talking about here? He's complaining to the governor of Florida, the Spanish governor of Florida, that you use a cheat code. You're using black people to fight in your war. You can't do that. No, no, this, that, this, we have a code here. White people fight each other, right? You can't use black people. And the governor of Florida's response to that was like, you break into my house, and I have a bigger gun than you, and you blame me? <laughs> Another letter from David Mitchell, Governor David Mitchell, to Secretary of State James Monroe. They have armed every able-bodied Negro within their power. And then he continues. They have also received from Havana a reinforcement of nearly two companies of black troops. If these blacks are suffered to remain in the province, our southern country will soon be in a state of insurrection. They started making comparisons to the Haitian Revolution in these sources. Now this, these are their words. No historian interpreting these things. These are governors, the generals, the secretary of state, all that stuff. And then what really put the nail in the coffin for these patriot invaders was the uh, ambush at the 12 mile swamp right near St. Augustine. There were about 60-something black men dressed up as Indians, just waiting for a convoy of US soldiers to pass through. And they ambushed them. It says here, on September 13, 1812, Governor Sebastian Kindelan writes to Juan Ruiz, de Apuraca, our parties are blacks whom they, or whom they think are Indians because they wear the same clothing and go painted. So they thought they were Indians, but they were in fact dressed as such. They were the blacks fighting. A few days later, Governor David Mitchell writes to Secretary Monroe, the governor of St. Augustine has sufficient influence with these Indians a part of the Creeks residing in Florida called the Seminoles, to induce them to fall upon the defenseless settlers on the St. John's and on our side of the St. Mary's. On the St. John's, they have killed and scalped one and wounded two more, besides, dri besides driving off from both places a large number of Negroes and a stock of every description. Driving off Negroes. Looks like they're emancipating them. Mitchell continued in the letter to Monroe that the Florida governor proclaimed freedom to every Negro who will join the standard 
and has sent a party of them to unite with and who are actually at this time united with the Indians in their murderous excursions. It is a fact that most of our male Negroes on the seaboard are restless and make many attempts to get to St. Augustine. They were worried that the whole entire Southeast might turn into a Haiti. Then he continues, the principal strength of the garrison of St. Augustine consists of Negroes. John McIntosh who was one of the directors that originally uh, conspired this whole thing. He writes to James Monroe, Secretary of State, our slaves are excited to rebel and we have an army of Negroes raped up in this country and brought from Cuba to be connected with. St. Augustine, the whole province, Will be refuge of will be refuge of fugitive slaves and from dense emissaries. Will be detached to bring about the revolt of the black population of the United States. They were very fearful that this would start spreading across the entire country. So we, after this ambush at Twelve Mile Swamp, many of the patriots they said, "Forget it. It was a complete failure. It was a blunder," and they left Florida. In the War of 1812 happens, many of the blacks in Florida fight on the side of the British. We all know what happens at the war, end of the War of 1812. The British obviously lose, but they have a fort in North Florida called Fort Nichols. It's known by the Spanish as Loma de Buena Vista. But now it's referred to as Negro Fort because the British gave up the fort to the, to the blacks. And they gave them all the weapons and ammunition and everything that was there and said, y'all can have it. So the blacks occupied the fort and a bunch of the ruined villages, of about 800 people, were established all around. And they grew their own food, had their own livestock, and did all that stuff. And the people in the fort defended those maroon communities outside the fort. But then this guy named William Crawford writes a letter to General Andrew Jackson. He says, sir, it appears from the representations of Colonel Hawkins that the Negro fort erected during the war at the junction of the Catahoochee and Flint Rivers has been strengthened since that period and now occupied by between 250 and 300 blacks who are well armed, clothed, and disciplined. Secret practices to enable Negroes from the frontiers of Georgia, as well as from the Cherokee and Creek nations, are still continued by the Negroes in hostile creeks. Should it be determined that the destruction of the fort does not require the sanction of the legislature, measures will be promptly taken for its reduction. March 20th, 1816, General Edmund Gaines, where Gainesville gets its name, writes to General Andrew Jackson, if intercourse can be opened down the Apalachicola, it would enable us to keep an eye open, an eye upon the settlement in the Fort Negro. The Negro establishment is, I think, justly considered as likely to produce much evil among the blacks of Georgia and the eastern part of the Mississippi Territory. Will you permit us to break it up? A couple weeks later, Jackson responds, if they are stealing and enticing away our Negroes, they ought to be viewed as a band of outlaws, land pirates, and ought to be destroyed. So, in June, July of that year, they first sent people on the land to try to destroy the Negro Fort unsuccessfully. But then they sent a gunboat, gunboat up the uh, Apalachicola River, shot a cannon, hit a powder keg, blew up everything. The majority of the black people living in the Negro Fort were killed. Many of them eventually escaped. Those that escaped safely were able to flee to other maroon communities. We had a lot of maroon communities established along the Sewanee River. Some of them mixed in with other Native Americans living in Fowl Town and places like that. And the thing about this history is a lot of people, the first Seminole War starts, what people refer to as the first Seminole War, starts 1817, 1818. But it's nothing but a continuation of what was going on here, right? These same Africans fled this area and they started mixing in with other maroon communities throughout Florida and other Native American communities throughout Florida. 
What Jackson ordered here just continued on for another couple of years. They, they, they started shooting at Fowltown. The, the Maroons of Fowltown responded and they started, they went to Fort Scott and killed some people. Then the U.S. Army responded and they went and destroyed some communities along the Suwannee River. This went on all the way until 1818, until finally the Spanish were like, look, y'all got it. We're not even really there like that anymore. And the Spanish gave up Florida. But just because the Spanish gave up Florida doesn't mean that it has been given up. There was a treaty signed, the Adams on East Treaty, in 1821, which gave Florida to the United States. But there was a couple of people that they did not take into consideration. Were the natives involved in that treaty? No. Were the runaway maroons involved in that treaty? No. So these, what they call black Seminoles and native Seminoles, continued to fight. And this is where history gets a little bit confusing. Sometimes you hear the word Seminole and you automatically think Native American. But the word Seminole is not a pre-colonial native word. It actually comes from the word Cimarron. Right? Cimarron, through time, that word had become debased, corrupted. Cimarron became known as Cimarron, and Cimarron became known as Seminole. So the word Seminole has its origins in the word used to describe runaway slaves. So I am a professor at Runaway Slave State College. <laughs> I went to Runaway Slave, South Runaway Slave Middle School. <laughs> Uh, we used to we used to play uh, runaway slave high school and basketball and sampling. <laughs> so now the United States government is like, well, we're not making the treaties with the Spanish now. So now we got to talk to the natives. Sorry, treaty with Florida tribes, Moultrie Creek. And by the way, Jackson is still sending troops all into Florida, crushing the blue communities this entire time, right? They're fighting back. The Maroons are fighting back, but you know sometimes they got to move. And it got to a point where one of the one of the Maroon communities by Tampa Bay got crushed in 1821. Many of those people ended up fleeing to uh, Andros Island, Bahamas. But in the Treaty of Moultrie Creek, Article Seven states the chiefs and warriors after mentioned for themselves and tribes stipulate to be active and vigilant in the preventing the retreating to or passing through of the district of country assigned them of any absconding slaves or fugitives from justice. So now they're trying to talk to the, to the natives and say, look, help us catch these people. But the natives are like, no, nah, man, those are our homeboys. We've been fighting together all these years. We're not just going to give them up like that. And besides, the natives don't have like one king that rules over all of them. There's like a myriad of like, it's like a confederation of villages of people where you have like, your great grandfather is basically like the leader of this clan. And then over there you got another great grandfather that's the leader of that clan. So it's not really like how we think of governments operating. William Pope Duval County says, he writes a letter to the Seminole. You are not to mind what the Negroes say, they will lie and lead you astray in the hope to escape their white owners and that you will give them refuge and hide them. Do your duty and give them up. They care nothing for you further than to make use of you to keep out the hands of their master. He's really trying. Really trying to separate the blacks from the natives. Then 1830 comes around and you have, anybody know what happens in 1830? with Native Americans. Dylan? Yeah, it's the beginning of the, the, the Indian Removal Act. Right? So now there's like, okay, we're trying to remove everybody to the, to the west side of the Mississippi. Florida included. The Treaty of Payne's Landing was more specific to Florida. They made a deal with some of the so-called chiefs of all the Seminoles, and they said, look, we're all going Y'all are all gonna go west, but you're not taking 
Blacks were Seminoles were like, no, they were not going. We're all going to fight together. And they saw that the Seminoles were getting more and more you know, riled up and everything like that. And so were their, their black allies. This leads us to what was known as the Dave Massacre. This is a depiction of the Day Massacre. On December 28, 1835, you had uh, Francis Dade, who was leading 110 troops from Fort Brooke near Tampa all the way to Fort King near Ocala. And by his surprise, he was ambushed by 180 black and native Seminoles. They killed every single one of those 110, except for two. Two survived. One of them, one of those two only survived two days. They told what happened, they said, these Negroes just popped out of nowhere, and they just started going, going in hard on us. And we couldn't do anything. Surrounding the Maroon villages also participated in the day massacre. No one even knew that these troops had been killed. It wasn't until February of the next year that they came through. Some U.S. soldiers walked through and they said, guys, damn. <laughs> Decomposed bodies just laying there, vultures and all this stuff, eating up all kinds of critters. So this is a quote, January 20th, 1836, Elias Wallen writes, now just conceive their position, the Seminoles, 800 or 1,000 warriors, animated by the sentiments of hatred or revenge, and well aware what is to be their fate upon losing their superiority. With them, three or 400 Negroes of their own, better disciplined and more intelligent than themselves, to whom there is a daily ascension of runaway Negroes from the plantations, supplied with arms and ammunition from the deceased whites. So after they killed them, they took all their guns, General Jessup ends up taking over as lead general in Florida on, in early December. And he's quickly, he quickly realizes that, he says here in a letter to the uh, Secretary of War, this, you, need, you may be assured, is a Negro, not an Indian war. And if it be not speedily put down, the South will feel the effects of it on their slave population before the end of the next season. So he's trying to figure out a way now. He's like, how do I, how do I resolve this issue? If I, if we try to make the, the natives go, you know, to the new territory, the blacks are going to be, you know, they're, they're not going to take that lightly. Obviously, we can't enslave them because if we try to enslave them, then they're going to fight back. So they say, you know what we're going to do? This is what General just comes up with. He comes up March 6, 1837, Article Five. Articles of capitulation. It says the Seminoles and their allies who come in and emigrate west shall be secure in their lives and property, that their Negroes, their bona fide property, should also accompany them west. So Jessup's thinking, well, if I call them the Negroes their property, maybe the whites will just let them go. Right? <laughs> That's an interesting line of thinking, but that didn't work either the property of Seminoles because they thought that placated a lot of white folks. As long as the white people think that we're not free, then that's okay. We must belong to somebody. April 18, 1837, uh, General Jessup writes to uh, Governor Richard Call. Oh, and by the way, there was a, um, eight, well, let me go back to this. After the Articles of Capitulation, after, after they, he issued this, the whites realized that he was just bluffing. They, the bona fide property should also accompany them west. Those whites were pissed. They're like, no, like that's our property. 
So once uh, General Jessup realized how pissed off they were, he rescinded on this whole Article 5 and said, okay, okay, okay. So he issues Field Order 70, which he, where he's now he's saying, okay, all recent runaways that ran away like in the past two years have to return to their masters. Everybody else can go out with us. So now the blacks, they're all like, well, how can you tell the difference, right? So a lot of whites, so a lot of the blacks started to meet up at the post to emigrate west, but then they saw a lot of white slave owners waiting there with their with their chains in their hand, and they're like, uh-uh. And so they skedaddled. The blacks started to flee. They're like, no, we ain't coming here. And this is what this next one's about. He says, if the citizens of the territory be prudent, the war may be considered at an end. But any attempt to interfere with Indian Negroes would cause an immediate resort to hostilities. The Negroes control their masters. They notice that any time that the blacks would flee these posts, the natives would follow behind them. The Negroes control their masters. And he writes, 30 or more of the Indian Negro men were at a nearby camp on the, Wicla, on the Wicklacuchi late in March. But the arrival of two or three citizens of Florida said to be in search of Negroes caused them to disperse. Because they were like, well, we're gonna get the most recent runaways. But they're, they're not just getting the most recent runaways. They're trying to grab all black people that they could that are waiting at these posts. So General Jessup eventually rescinds on Field Order 7. And he's like, okay, now I, I gotta just start picking out black settlers to make relationships with and just try to convince them, look, just please trust me. Emigrate West, meet up at this post. I'll make sure no one takes you. June 16, 1837, Jessup writes to the Secretary of War, the two races, the Negro and the Indian, are rapidly approximating. They are identified in interests and feelings. And I have ascertained that at the Battle of Wahoo, a Negro, the property of a Florida planter, was one of the most distinguished of the leaders. He continues in this letter, I have learned that the depredations committed on the plantations east of the St. John's were perpetrated by the plantation Negroes, headed by an Indian Negro, John Caesar, since killed and aided by some six or seven vagabond Indians who had no character among their people as warriors. And this is the last quote I'll read. <clears throat> Should the Indians remain in this territory, the Negroes among them will form a rallying point for runaway Negroes from the adjacent states. And should they remove, the vastnesses of the country would be immediately occupied by Negroes. Eventually, General Jessup and later generals made deals with a maroon by the name of Abraham, John Horse, and others. They, to remove, they were eventually, I think it was about 250 of them were able to move out west under an agreement, and another about 250 also went out west, not necessarily in this agreement, but made it out west as well. Many of the descendants of black Seminoles today, you can find in uh, the Bahamas, you can find them in Cuba, you can find them in Oklahoma, you can find them in El Nacimiento, Mexico, but these, this is the group of people that fought, bled, died for the freedom. They found generational freedom in Florida. They raised kids there, they defended their kids there, and they emancipated themselves from slavery. And uh, what does all this mean to me? To me, it's important just to know that black people didn't just have a history of begging for freedom. They didn't have a history of doing nothing about their circumstances or situation. So that's why I really appreciate the opportunity to co-curate with Katie Benson and bring this history to light about the successful slave revolt of the blacks in Florida where they established freedom for generations. Thank you. Any questions? I didn't know it was going to take that long.
Mr. Domingo. No, I haven't. You called in on Florida. Yeah. Um, but that's a good book because you were talking about Nat Turner. Uh, the book is just filled with all the, uh, the votes that occurred within the plantation system of America. Yeah, yeah. It's because the way that we're given this through movies and our history books is that uh, the slaves didn't revolt because they were given freedom when they were looking south of the population. So it takes agency away from the people who actually fought and revolted. Uh, and uh, they actually um, brought the system down from within. Mm -hmm. Slavery has to end, not because of the niceness of Lincoln yeah. and the radical Republicans. It had to end because it was called the part of the system. It doesn't change all yeah. no, Absolutely. Thank you. I remember you told me about that book before I asked the bar with but you said, I already have one of your books, so. <laughs> It's a sound cut. Uh, <laughs> Question. How do you feel? Is, is progressing? How do you feel Florida yeah. and the blacks compared to the Oklahoma? What What is happening in Florida? Um, you check that history. How do you see education, development, job, uh, progress? What, what do you think? I mean, I don't, I don't like I might get into politics and stuff too much, but 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 I, but I'll, what I'll say is this: uh, education-wise, uh, I think Florida is a little bit behind other places. When I went to, I moved to Washington D.C. and like I said, I learned a lot more about Florida history there than I learned here in Florida, and so I think that's very telling. So, and I can imagine like at, at some of the younger levels that it's. It, it, DC has a lot more museums, it's a lot more cultural. Like, they even had a, a restaurant there called Eatonville, right? Yes. And, uh, and there have been, so, <laughs> no, I mean, no, that's, that's, that's a city. <laughs> but it was based on this city, right? And it's like, that's how cultural some of these other places are outside, outside of Florida. And I think sometimes here in Florida, we don't always appreciate, like, the rich history that we have here. But, I mean, that's on, that's on the state level. I mean, I'm, I'm a maroon kind of guy. I believe that we should do things self-sufficiently on our own. So it starts within the community as much as possible. Dylan? Um, so, so like, I, I was just going to ask, like, so with Georgia, it seems like a buffer state right between, like, slave and the slave and the Carolinas and the Florida. So is there any well, they were adding, you know, they were adding like colony, one colony at a time, like in the, early, in the 1600s into the 1700s. Carolina was one of the early ones. Virginia was one of the early ones. Um, Carolina wasn't even divided yet; it was just Carolina, and they called it. They divided into North and South in 1712. But all that others. As a matter of fact, Virginia was everything from the East Coast all the way to the, the, the Rocky Mountains. Like, they didn't even know what was out there, but that was all Virginia, right? And it's the same thing for Carolina. So Native, Native Americans, runaway slaves, they would also escape West as well. And they would just mix in with populations that were out there. But we don't really know about those areas as much because there was no like so-called civilized people living out there, right? We always have a tendency to just, you know, talk about where the, where people went, where others were civilized, and that's the difference between uh, a maroon community and and just a, another kind of runaway. Like Harriet Tubman, she's running away into a place where it's already state occupied, state owned, acknowledged. Maroons have a tendency to run off the grid and and, and be undetected. So sometimes people make a distinction between the runaways, the runaways that fled into Fort Jose and were seeking, I guess, I don't even want to say protection because they were protecting the Spanish themselves, but we were seeking validation from the Spanish. They say that that's not necessarily a maroon, but the ones that escaped deeper into Florida, creating independent communities, those were the ones that were actually maroons. Yeah. Um, I saw a hand up over here. 
So what do you think about oh. the what do you think about the uh suit uh February sixth? Samarum, you know, I thought that actually meant Simarum, but that's just a mixture of Seminole and Orange County. Sem Oran. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they're playing games with us. Maybe it really is Simarum. <laughs> So yeah, in, in a, uh, and I would say in a legal sense, and this is why I say I don't ever talk about history from a from a legal sense because people can find freedom before the white man validates it, right? Just like I said with Florida, just the same thing was in Virginia, the same thing in North Carolina, same thing in Louisiana. So black people did find freedom here in the United States prior to any white man putting a stamp on it. And as a matter of fact, in Haiti. When they found, when they had the Haitian Revolution and they found their freedom, some of the leaders of the Haitian Revolution wanted to be validated by France. So what did they, what did they end up doing? Yes, they paid France reparations. Is that freedom? No. So I don't even think freedom comes in uh, you being validated by your enemy. Freedom comes in you validating your own space for yourself and creating that space for yourself. As a matter of fact. There's, you ever heard of the Laku, the Laku system? Those are the people that live in the sticks in Haiti, right? They live all the way out in the countryside. Those people are free. Those are the ones that said, I'm not, I'm not con getting conscripted into your military. I'm not working on your sugar plantations. They saying this to their now their own black Haitian government in 1800. They said, I'm gonna live out here in the woods and do my own thing and barter with my, my friends. That's freedom. So I wouldn't even argue that Haiti itself, had the Haitian Revolution, amounts to freedom. Because a lot of the Africans that were in Haiti were born in Africa. A lot of the ones that wanted to be recognized as a valid state, they were actually, they were born in Haiti as slaves. They wanted the acceptance of their former masters. And so they're the ones that fought for that and tried to sell out the rest of their people in the process. But the majority of them said, no, I'm going to come out here and carve out my own Laku system, which is basically a maroon system under the modern state. Because they realize that statism equals slavery. That makes sense. So what do you think this information is like absent generally in black history? Is it more like ignorance or do you think it's purposely being withheld? I think it's purposeful. Yeah, definitely. It's purposeful. At every every country has propaganda. Uh, and they, they want they want to get your citizens to believe certain things and to be on one accord in what they believe. But you know, I think through time, if, if, if enough historians and young people like yourself decided, well, I'm going to do my own research and then bring this to the forefront, I think eventually, because there's been people writing about this since the 1960s, but you still don't really see it in history. If you see like a little passage sometimes here and there but it's not i think it's intentionally left out you know all of this is really great information because they didn't know any of it but when the spanish you said the spanish actually gifted the united states to florida so when the spanish did that what did you say like 1836 no 1821 it was it was an original treaty in 1819, and then there was like a follow-up finalized treaty in 1821, the Adams and Treaty. So when they, the United States, no longer allowed the, uh, the uh, slaves to be brought in, they couldn't be brought in any longer. Yeah, from from the African continent. Yeah, yeah. 1808 was the end of that. Okay, yeah. so so all the slaves had to be born here. And yeah, but there was an illegal slave trade from Africa, 
And they got slick with it. Cuba started picking up their slave trade after 1800. So, and this went on all the way until 1867. So Africans were getting sold to Cuba. So what do you think they were doing in Georgia and Alabama and Louisiana? They were just purchasing them from Cuba. So now uh, when, when the Spanish gifted the United States with Florida, was that allowed then to be a slave state? Yeah, that's what they were working so hard for. Yeah, so, so yeah. then. So by 1845, March 3rd, Florida becomes a state, and it became a slave state. And but even prior to that, there were um, they established between 1821 and 1836. They established 22 sugar plantations in Florida. Those blacks burned down 21 of them. Yeah. <laughs> she said, "Good for them." <laughs> okay, so it became a slave state, so that you had people coming in. Uh, but, oh, what was my question? I, I don't know, I, I mean, I'm confused because with the Indian and the, and the Negro. Yeah. So the people that were already here were turned into slaves, they were? No, the, and this is what the whole battle was about. They're trying to capture these free people and turn them into slaves. But General Jessup ended up working out a deal to where 500 of them could eventually leave. But a lot of these new enslaved people that were living on plantations, and I don't even like to refer to all of them as enslaved because some of them were very free-minded and worked with the Maroons in secret, like clandestinely. But on these plantations, they, these were the ones that were being shipped in in the domestic slave trade or were coming from, from Cuba by way of Africa. So there were, like ever since 1821, uh, when Florida officially became part of the United States, Building up to the Second Summer of War in the 1830s, they were constantly bringing in enslaved people. And that wasn't in Florida, that was Alabama, that was Mississippi, that was Louisiana, that was Texas. Because when we got all that land after the you know, Louisiana Purchase and after the Mexican American War and all that stuff, we just kept adding new people. So the enslaved population goes from 790,208 in the year 1790 all the way to 4, 4 million by 1860. And that is through like domestic slave trade, breeding, uh, purchasing of Cuba, all that, all that stuff. And just capturing free people. Because the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 gives you now the, the teeth to go up north and just kidnap free people and bring them back down south. Bill? Oh, obviously I can ask because I got me Oh, Osceola. So oh, some people say one of Osceola had two wives, and then some people say that one of his wives was black, and they say that his his black wife was kidnapped, and this is what radicalized Osceola. Yeah, in the mass, yeah. So it, Agent Wiley Thompson, one of the Indian agents, they, he locked up Osceola for getting all irate and everything like that. But the massacre was happening simultaneously when they released Osceola from prison. He killed Agent Wiley Thompson and all the guards around the prison. And then the massacre was happening at the same time in, uh, for, in the day massacre. Eighteen thirty eight. Yeah. And then eighteen thirty eight is when you had the hundreds of them emigrate to Oklahoma. And then from Oklahoma, many of them emigrated to Mexico because people started trying to capture them into slavery in Oklahoma. And so they were like, We're not safe here either. So then they went to Mexico. Mexico abolished slavery way back in eighteen twenty nine. So from the Spanish day the United States did Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Good questions. But Cuba had slaves also. Cuba had, Cuba had slaves also. Yeah. So how could a, a black man escape to Cuba? 
But even Florida had slavery. Yeah. So the Spanish operated differently with slavery. Like you can be black and free and be okay. Right? And sometimes you can you can even be black and have money and wealth in some Spanish countries. You weren't indicted before you were born in certain Latin American countries as the same way you were in Anglo countries. In Anglo countries, it was like one, have you ever heard of the one drop rule? Like you got one drop of black blood, you're, you're black, right? Yeah. Right? Uh, Thomas Jefferson's mistress, Sally Hemings, she was an octoroon. She, she was one eighth black, but she was enslaved, right? So she, she was female typically I think, I don't know, I've never seen her before, but I can imagine if she's an octoroon, she's probably feeling typically white looking. But you gotta get as many as you can, and that's how, you don't gotta go to Africa anymore. To get your slaves, you just gotta rape a black woman. Terrible history. Yeah. Somebody had a hand up? I was just gonna say, like, with the Spanish, so they would kind of like let you go after a while. Yeah, and it's not to not to downplay like uh, the atrocities of the Spanish either. They had their atrocious slavery, especially when you had sugar plantations. But there were more avenues to freedom in Latin American countries because, like, if they had they still had the uh, inheriting from your father rule, right? So if a white man impregnates a black woman, then the child will inherit the status of a white man. So you, it, you, you've got a lot of brown free people in Latin America. Mixed race people. I know slavery is not that good, so uh, between my friends, Spanish, and English, so which one of the life was like? I don't, I don't want to play the atrocious Olympics. <laughs> 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 I, I I don't know, man. I don't want to. It, it depends on the individual. They, but there are historians that debate that kind of thing. There's there's one by the name of Frank Tonnebaum. He says that Latin American slavery wasn't as harsh, you know. And he talks about all these reasons why. And then there's another guy, with a historian by the name of Leslie B. Rout Jr. He says Latin American slavery, even though on paper wasn't as harsh, in fact it was. So. You know, and then in the French, the same, the French had something called Code Noir, where it gave blacks a certain amount of rights under slavery. Do you think they practiced that in Haiti? Sometimes they did, but that, obviously they didn't. <laughs> That's why I think they revolted and kicked out every white person out of that island. Okay. Uh, do you, do you remember the quote just before the date massacre took place? No, what is that? Uh, they had made this arduous trip from Tampa and were closing in, I guess, on Ocala, their mm -hmm. final destination. And he turned to his men and said, have a glad heart, men. Our trials and tribulations are almost over. Minutes later, they were all dead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I never heard that quote. Wow. I said that. <laughs> That's a good way to end it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. The gallery, and then we're going to open the history museum too. If you want to see the exhibition, that would be great. Wonderful. Thank you. 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 Th